In our previous video, we hooked up a JSON parse service through the DAO layer, layer all the way through the service layer. We didn't actually see the user interface reflection of this though, so in this video we're going to take a look at that user interface reflection. Now the JSON service that we're invoking is a service that gives us back, back some plain details. So the way we're going to wire that up is we're going to use this universal top nav bar and we're essentially going to wire it up to the search button here and when we type in a plant name any type of plant name a genus species cultivar common name and hit search we want it to hit that json service and then we want it to parse that json service into a series of java objects next we want to display that series of java objects onto a list and we'll use some bootstrap to uh, display that list now i'm not sure we might do this in one or two videos we'll have to see how that goes so if we don't get all the way to the bootstrap don't worry i'll do a follow-on video that covers that let's take a look at what we have so far if we take a look at the plant dao we actually saw a couple different ways to parse json and i covered these in some pre previous videos so one's using retrofit which is the way i'm doing it at the moment and the other way is using a traditional approach where we actually open a socket and then we use json object and json array to read the data out of the so socket one by one each approach very good very valid uh, it's really a matter of what you prefer and now this is in the plant DAO layer. Let's navigate up to the service layer. And in the service layer, we see, well, one thing I need to fix right away, which is I'm hard coding maple into the service layer. On the other hand, we know that this fetch plants method actually accepts a string. And if we go back to the controller, which calls our service, we'll know that the string that we're passing in is whatever search term the user put in on that nav bar. Again, I did all of these in previous videos, so if you think, wow, I don't understand uh, all the stuff you're talking about, I covered them in some previous videos that I'll point you to. Nonetheless, we're getting the search term from the user, we're passing it in here, and then over in our specimen service, we're kind of throwing away the search term and just putting in maple tree. So let's go ahead and fix that. And while we're at it, let me give this parameter a better name. I'll go ahead and call it search term. And once I'm finished with this, I'll walk through all of this in the debugger so you can watch it step by step and you can get a good feel of how all of these things are connected. I will note that the controller is the controller of a model view controller architecture, so it does things like handle button clicks. The service layer, which is where we are now, is called by the controller, and the service layer will many times have business logic and also will aggregate together several different DAOs to make an entire concept. DAO is the data access object layer, which is where we're actually doing some kind of either reading or some kind of persistence. And one question you might ask is, why do we need to, why do we need to read the JSON at the DAO layer? Why can't we just put it directly into the HTML page? And that's a valid question. There are many different answers to that. Those are things that we will go through and discover in this series of videos. Nonetheless, let's go ahead and fix this and let's have it call search term and pass that all the way down and then I'm going to choose save. With that then, I will, uh, I'll tell you what, well, let's just go ahead and make sure that this part works so far. Let me run back to the controller and make sure that we have enough stuff there. And indeed, we have our endpoint mapped here for search plants. We have the search term parameter coming in. We are invoking our fetch plants with that search term and we are getting back a list of results. So there's enough there where we can at least snap a breakpoint. I'll tell you what, let me put a couple more things in just because it'll make a little more sense if I can snap a breakpoint and we can actually look at what gets returned. So we'll say model and view, model and view equals new model and view. And you might recall that this is what we're going to do if we want to pass back a page as well as some Java objects that we want to populate into that page. Now, with that model in view, let's go down to this try block. Remember what a try catch is. If we're doing something in the try block and if something goes wrong, it will go to the catch block. If everything is okay, it will skip the catch block. So let's go into the try block and take a look at where my cursor is right now. My cursor is after line 105. The only way we're going to get here is if line 105 executes properly by definition, how try catch blocks work. If line 105 throws an exception, then line 106 will get skipped. You can think of it a little bit like an if test, where line 106 will only execute if line 105 executes properly, 
And the block between 107 and 110 will only execute if line 105 does not execute successfully. Nonetheless, we can assume at this point in line 106 that we have a populated plant object. So I'm going to say model and view. Oops. And then I'm going to say set view name. And let's, whoops, no, no, let's uh, almost, there we go, dot set view name. And so this essentially is the HTML page that we're going to return. So let's call it plant results. And we'll need to make a, a page of this, of this look and feel. So plant results, like so. Okay. And then for the error, instead of saying return error, I have to, I have to do a few changes here. You see, I can't return a string anymore because I'm using this model in view. Uh, I'm not, if I were returning a string, the string would represent an HTML page. I need to represent an HTML page and I also need to give it a collection of objects to show. So because of that last part, because I have to give it a collection of objects to show, I have to change my return type of this method from string to model and view. And you see we made our model and view object here on line 103. And so now you notice that these other two return statements that I have are redlining because those are strings, they're not model and views. And that's just as well. This could use a little bit of refactoring because it's considered cyclomatic complexity or bad practice. Cyclomatic comp complexity is a component of technical debt, but uh, bad practice, cyclomatic comp complexity, to have multiple return statements in a method, you should really just have one return statement at the end of a method. Reason being, if you end up with a whole bunch of return statements and you end up with a 600 line method, which is also a bad idea, you might be at the bottom of that method and add some logic that you think will always fire, but indeed a previous return might take one flow out of the method before it gets to the end. So some refactoring I really want to do anyway. So uh, bear with me, this will take just a few lines. Instead of returning start, let's return model and view. Okay, uh, now, uh, now what is that? That's the variable I declared on line 103. Now what about line 110 though? Because if it's an exception, we don't want to act like everything is working fine. Probably one of the things that really is like nails on a chalkboard to me, one of the things that really drives me nuts is when I see this, an empty catch block. I can tell you from having worked in a lot of production level applications, it's not a matter of us, we, we don't write cool iPhone apps all day long and that's all we do. What we're really doing is we're spending most of our time troubleshooting issues that are happening in production. When you have an empty catch block, you're essentially throwing away all this really valuable information that's going to help you in debugging. So let's, let's what at the bare minimum, we should log something in an exception. Uh, we should also consider alternative paths for the user. So on the return here, instead of saying return error, well, let's consider what we did on line 106. I said model and view set name plant results. That would indicate success. And remember I said this is like an if test where line 106 will only execute if line 105 executes without error. Line 110 will only execute if line 105 does have an error. So let's change our view name in this catch block to indicate that something went wrong. In other words, uh, let's change our view name if we had an error. And we're simply going to say model and view, set view name, and then we'll say error. Okay, uh, one more thing that we want to do then, a couple more things actually. We're looking a lot closer to where we want to be. So I'm going to save, and I promise we'll do a demo here in, uh, in just a few moments, because I know I did promise that. Uh, okay, first of all, I'm going to take this fetch plants and I'm going to give it a little bit better variable name. I'm just going to call it plants. That'll be a little easier to work with. And remember what scope means. Scope means that this variable is accessible in the area that I'm highlighting right here. In other words, a variable is accessible from the point where it is declared to the close curly of the block where it is declared. So you see this plants variable isn't alive very long because it's declared within the try block and it goes out of scope on line 107 at that close curly. So let's do a little shenanigans to give this a little bit better visibility. I'm going to take this variable, cut it, and I'm going to move it before the try block. And now what is the scope of this variable? Well remember variable scope, the point at which the variable was declared until the close curly of the block where the variable is declared. So you see the blue highlighted area indicates where this variable has scope. 
Okay, now I do have a red line on 106. I simply need to say plants equals specimen service dot fetch plants. Okay, just a few more lines to go. Uh, if we, the, I want to take this plants object and I want to push it into my model and view. But one trick is the plants object only gets populated if line 106 executes properly. If we end up in the catch block, then this plants object is never going to get populated and we have a chance for a null pointer exception. So let me go ahead and give it kind of like just an initialization here. I'm going to say list plant DAO plants equals new array list and then plants. And then open and close parentheses just like so. Uh, uh, sorry, plant DTO. One little fix over here. Plant DTO, just like so. And then we'll want to import this array list. We'll go ahead and save. And normally we can control shift O or control one uh, or quick fix control one. That'll work for us, import array list. There we go. Now we know that plants will always e at least be an empty array. It won't be null. It will at least be an empty array. Uh, so even if line 107 fails, we'll still have an empty array, just an array with nothing in it. With that, let's go down to line 113 here, give ourselves some room. And I'm going to say model and view. And then we'll say dot set object. Uh, sorry, add object. Okay, add object. And we'll simply say, uh, okay, plants, just like so. And now our return is ready. Now, now finally at this, uh, and uh, let me clean this up. We don't really need, uh, since we've added more logic to this controller method, we don't need this line here. I just put that line in kind of as a debugger line previously before we had all this logic. So what I'll do now is I'll go ahead and save my work and redeploy. And I just want to walk through here and I want to confirm that we are indeed getting a list of plants that matches the search term that we're passing in. So I've restarted the application in the debugger and I have my page up here, my home page. I'll type in any plant name. Let's say Redbud, that's a good one. Remember now we're going against live data. So I hit search. Now I want you to follow the bouncing ball with me. Remember, we're currently on the HTML page, which is our view. From the view, we go to the controller, which handles button clicks and things like that. From the controller to the service, where the service is aggregating together several DAOs and also provides some business logic for us. And then to the DAO layer, which is parsing the JSON. So I put in Redbud and I hit search and Eclipse lights up orange, which is a good sign. And you notice that sure enough, it has hit our search plants endpoint, which is where our nav bar search button is mapped to hit. In other words, when I hit search, it's mapped here, which we might expect, and that's good news. So we go ahead and we step over and now we're creating our empty collection of plants. So there's going to be nothing in there. If you see, there's nothing there. And now the important part, Note that I'm in the plant places controller. Watch what happens when I do a step into here. I step into and we go to the specimen service that we just altered a little bit ago where we took out the hard coded maple and we passed pass through the search term. Now let's step in here and notice that we're going to a plant DAO. And, and once again, all of this is auto wired. This is all things that are just put together for us by spring. So we step into the plant DAO and we go through a little bit of retrofit. I'll kind of go over this. And there's going to be a little lag when it's going to actually parse the data. So uh, we'll kind of see a little lag there. It's, it's not so obvious because I'm stepping through the debugger. So the computer can't run as fast as it wants. It has to wait for me to tell it to run. So not so obvious there, but nonetheless, we step over. Now, here's our criteria. Here's our real test case. If I look at the plants here, does it have only red buds? Because remember, I searched on only red buds. So let's take a look in the debugger. Little tricky to get this lined up just right, but nonetheless, we'll get our little crosshairs if we can. And if not, I'll tell you what, don't even worry about that. We'll just expand like so. So expand the first one, and what do we have? We have an Eastern red bud, excellent. Expand number five, Ruby Falls Weeping Red Bud. We see a total of 18 plants, which uh, kind of makes sense. If it were 3,000 plants, I would wonder if there are actually 3,000 different kinds of redbud in the world, but there's not. There's uh, 18 plants. So plant number 17, weeping Texas redbud, and plant number 18, Chinese redbud. So sure enough, we are getting results that match our search term. 
So we and, and also notice that it went from line 106 to line 107, which indicates that line 107 did execute properly. So again, more good news. So I will go ahead and step over and step over. The catch block does not fire. We add our collection of plants, which is that collection of 18 red buds, just confirming again, and step over, and then I'm going to go ahead and tell it to resume. Now, we're not going to have a really nice look and feel here because I have not created a page called Plant Results, but that's okay. We've at least seen that we can go from HTML to controller to service to DAO, fetch records based on our search results, and get those records back. So we'll probably get an error page if we look. Yeah, sure enough, we get an error page if we go back to our site. No worries. Let's go ahead and wrap up this video. In our next video, we will make an HTML page and we will show how we can display each of these plant results into a nice user-friendly form. I look forward to seeing you then.